the internet, and welcome to another episode of Byzantium and Friends. I am Anthony, your host. Unless you have been studiously avoiding the news, which, let me tell you, I've been tempted to do, you will know that extremist right-wing ideologies are entering the public sphere again. Now, we thought these were all banished into the wilderness, but they're back. And I don't mean neoliberalism or trickle-down economics, but overt white supremacy and the like their pervasive presence online, where one of their tactics is to generate and proliferate racist memes and try to contaminate as many areas of our culture as they can. The strategy seems to be to taint as many areas of our common culture as they can so as to make the rest of us think twice about using them lest we be accused of propagating right-wing memes and ideas. So in this way, they've tried to claim classical antiquity, So this is as part of a white project, remember, and the Middle Ages. And the goal is to present the Middle Ages as exclusively white and Christian and inspire a return to that kind of imagined racial purity or at least racial order. And they idolize Vikings for their violence against others and Crusaders for their violence against Muslims in particular. And a strictly binary gender order which they seem to have taken from the 1950s, supercharged it, filtered it through Victorian rhetoric, and then projected back onto the Middle Ages. This ideological project, I should add, has its exact Muslim corollaries. Uh, Think of ISIS, for example, uh, savvy online media agitators who call for the violent expulsion of people who are different, and the revival of a pseudo-medieval state in which they are on top. And I I read a book once years ago that called it the Digital Caliphate. Today's guests are Amy Kaufman, an independent scholar and author, and Paul Sturdivant, uh, editor of The Public Medievalist and a scholar at the Smithsonian Institution. They have written a book on this topic called The Devil's Historians, How Modern Extremists Abuse the Medieval Past, which exposes and debunks these toxic ideologies on both the Christian and the Muslim side which, after all, are mirror images of each other. This is a very accessible book, concise and informative, and before reading it, I was aware of only a few of the nooks and crannies uh, in which these ideologies are festering. Now, they don't discuss Byzantium much in the book, so I thought that I would bring it to the table as an interlocutor to our discussion to offer a Byzantine counterpoint to some of these areas of concern. And precisely because the book is quite readable, and you should read it, our conversation revolves more around the general issues posed by extremist ideologies and their use of the past, rather than the specific ideas and tropes that they are propagating. If you want to hear more about those, I recommend the interview that Amy and Paul gave last month to Danielle Sibulski on the Medieval Podcast, uh, which is also hosted on the website Medievalist.net, like this one. If you heard that episode, don't worry, this one will not overlap much with it. Now, you might ask, are there not modern extremists on the neo-Byzantine side? That is, who are trying to use a picture of an imaginary Byzantium to advocate violence? And the answer is yes. Yes, there are. There are many online forums that have basically been taken over with toxic Byzantine or neo-Byzantine memes. Um, characteristic is the use of the uh, two-headed eagle uh, holding a sword or a globe or two swords. Um, Anyway, that eagle is largely a modern invention, um, as happens often with extremist ideologies. This is a neo-medieval past that they're imagining. And the ideological shape of these uh, forums is that of basically anti-Muslim and specifically anti-Turkish agitation. They can even be called Orthodox fundamentalists uh, that advocate things like the return of Hagia Sophia to Christian uh, Orthodox worship, and they emanate from countries such as Serbia, Russia, and Greece. Now, I am not sure whether these postings reflect a coherent political platform, uh, certainly not one that lobbies with actual governments, uh, as the forces of white supremacy do in the U.S., The ideological content of orthodox extremism is remarkably thin, um, and it has very little to do with the creation of a neo-Byzantine social, political, gender, or racial order. 
It just fixates on anti-Muslim and anti-Turkish hatred. After all, Byzantium is not easily racialized, and its historical presence does not align very well with those of modern nations. Anyway, I could go into this at some length. It's not the topic at hand, uh, maybe a future episode. I'll note only that Greece's far-right fascist party, Golden Dawn, was just yesterday declared a criminal organization by a court in Greece after a long trial, um, and its top leadership were found guilty of running basically a criminal gang disguised as a political party. Moreover, Golden Dawn was not driven by toxic Byzantinism to begin with. In some respects, it was more aligned with racist neo-paganism. Now, you might also ask, are these extremists basically not beyond reason? Like, they haven't arrived at their views through the study of history or the rational investigation of anything, and aren't we just wasting our breath trying to argue against their readings? Like, isn't it futile to try to debunk all of this? And to a certain degree, yes, you're not going to enter into a conversation with a white supremacist and use reason and they come away a changed person. That, that's a rather idealized scenario. Though, as Amy and Paul point out in the book, and I direct your attention to that part of it, pedagogy and instruction is not a hopeless endeavor in this regard. Students do come into our courses with all kinds of misconceptions, and it is possible to teach them away from these kinds of extremist ideologies, or at least the warped versions of history on which they rely. And I would like to add an insight of my own from decades of teaching in a Midwestern American university that very often the students who are the most strident and vocal and sometimes even disruptive in asserting their ideological positions in the face of historical evidence or argumentation are the ones who are really seeking most to be persuaded away from them. Uh, they are advocating the case that they have either been brought up in or been exposed to as teenagers in strong language because they want precisely the strongest version um, of those extremist beliefs to be countered. And um, we always have to be very gentle about this and, and non-confrontational and only you know, take steps when we are basically invited to do so. I, I will point to the second book of Plato's Republic as a wonderful illustration of exactly this kind of dynamic. I would like to make one more point before we get to the interview. It is this. These charged debates about antiquity or the Middle Ages often function as proxy debates about current policy, about inclusion, multiculturalism, you know, racial orders, and so forth. And it is sometimes tempting to get drawn into the minutia of arguing whether, say, there were black people in ancient Britain, or all of the topics that Amy and Paul bring attention to that are sites of contestation in these debates with extremists. And by all means, bogus ideas about the past need to be refuted, and that is our job as historians. We, ha we have to do that. At the same time, I think it's always important to remember from the standpoint of political philosophy or just even of being principled people that ultimately the policies that we advocate for the present, especially if we are concerned to build an inclusive and just and relatively equal world that counters the looming dangers of climate change and plutocracy and, and, and racist violence and so forth, that ultimately it doesn't matter what any ancient or medieval society looked like or what policies it had. So from the standpoint of principle, it simply doesn't matter whether there were uh, black or brown people in ancient Britain. Uh, we're not taking our cue from the medieval societies in that way ancient and medieval societies had slaves. <laughs> they had all kinds of 
uh, aspects that we simply wouldn't tolerate or admit. Um, so ultimately, the argument from ancient or medieval precedent uh, is moot, philosophically. We need to make our own way in the world based on what we think is right, based on principles <clears throat> that we are charting for our own society. And I don't think that any ancient or medieval society had the same ones. And so we are not answerable to them. Here is my interview with Amy and Paul. Hello, Amy and Paul. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. So I wanted to get a sense here for why you wrote this book. So what, what you see happening that you thought made it necessary. And specifically, your book exposes all these number of ways in which extremist groups today are using this very distorted or, or invented idea of the Middle Ages to justify their agendas. Uh, so can you just tell us in advance, generally, what kinds of groups and what kinds of aspects of the Middle Ages are we talking about here, just so the audience can, can know the context? Sure. So one example of this is um, alt-right groups or uh, far-right white supremacist groups, uh, which have a long legacy as far back as the Ku Klux Klan of using concepts like chivalry to promote white supremacy. So uh, the Klan used it. They actually um, used it in their ads to recruit people both into the Ku Klux Klan and into committing acts of violence against Black Americans. They would include language in their ads about protecting white women, about knighthood and service, and use it to get people riled up. And you can kind of see the legacy of that um, in a shooter like Dylan Roof, for instance, who attacked a Black church and massacred people in a Black church. And when he was um, asked about it, he talked about protecting white women from black attackers. So this was, this is one of the ways that modern extremists use a medieval concept, chivalry, which they've sort of distorted in order to promote violence, in order to promote their own agendas. Yeah, and I mean, you can see that in a lot of the right-wing movements uh, that you find today, and particularly in the terrorist acts that are done by far-right extremists, where they will decorate their weapons uh, with medieval references and iconography. Anders Breivik, the Norwegian terrorist who killed over 40 people in Norway, he Several people have talked about his manifesto, his nearly thousand page manifesto, mm. um, wherein he fashions himself as a uh, quote unquote knight justicar of the new uh, new order of the Knights Templar Europe, an organization which, as far as I think anyone understands, does not actually exist. And this involved creating an intricate costume for himself cobbled together from military gear drawn from all over the world. Um, but also similarly, not to only be using the Crusades, he also inscribed his weapons that he used to commit these acts with Mjolnir and Gunnir, the uh, Hammer of Thor and the Spear of Odin. I am told by a uh, Viking scholar friend of mine uh, in runes uh, that, don't actually, that don't actually read that, but you can get close enough. To some degree with the alt-right, a lot of what we are seeing isn't necessarily a consistent ideology. It's whatever sticks. They're throwing, they're throwing medievalisms at the wall and seeing what sticks. Anything that seems to intimate towards either a, a quote-unquote white supremacist past or grievances with the Muslim world or both, they will try to use it in order to, to justify acts of, of violence and terrorism and war. Yeah, and I'd, I'd like to add something to that, that these groups often aren't engaging with the real Middle Ages. They're not really interested in history. The runes are, are a good example of that. They're often getting their Middle Ages filtered through popular culture, right? Uh, 19th century or 20th, 20th century versions of the Middle Ages that are often whitened. Uh, they're often made more masculine than they actually were. So it's a filtered medievalism. They aren't they're interested in a myth much more than history. Yeah, so you would describe this as a kind of neo-medieval aesthetic that they're going for, that it, it's not backed by scholarship, it's just kind of what they think medieval looks like. Yes, right? yeah, I think in many cases. There is a, a deep ideological template here in the sense that, I mean, you mentioned chivalry, 
chivalry, I mean, as an ideal, if we can call it that, it basically marshals male violence to defend a gendered order, right, where the woman is passive, but there also has to be some sort of ogre or dragon or enemy to be slain, and that usually is taken to be a, you know, the Black Americans or Muslims or whatever, right? Like it's not, yes. it's not just aesthetic. It's it's a, no. it's, a, it's an actual so- social order. So one of the paradoxes that struck me as I was reading your book about these groups is that medieval seems to be taken in these two senses and they're, they're opposite from each other. So when these groups are talking about the other that they don't like, they will use medieval as an accusation that, oh, this other group is medieval, it's barbaric, it's committing all these crimes, you know, whether it's ISIS or, or whatever. That's the negative view of the Middle Ages that has a long trajectory in Western, in, you know, modern Western culture, like modernity is defined as having surpassed and, and transcended the barbarism of the Middle Ages. But at the same time, they use sometimes the same people, and, and you note this sometimes, they use the Middle Ages as a normative, positive ideal, right? Like, like some, a time of some kind of purity or an original order. Can you reflect a little bit just on this paradox it struck me as, as recurring throughout the book? Yeah, there are a lot of paradoxes that are inherent in uh, right-wing extremist ideologies. And when I said before that uh, they're using sort of taking whatever they can, throwing it against a wall and seeing what it sticks, that's actually, as far as I understand it, that's kind of the only consistency to a lot of their ideological positions. There's actually a a YouTuber who I uh, have found very insightful um, called Innuendo Studios that has a series called the Alt-Right Playbook. And in that series, in that particular series, there's one video that I've found very insightful in terms of looking at some of this. And the video is called The Card Says Moops, which is based on a Seinfeld joke. And the Seinfeld joke is that they're playing Trivial Pursuit and there's a question about who, uh, what medieval group lived in the south of Spain, you know, and, and the answer they know is Moors. But then George says, no, no, you're wrong because the card says Moops. And the idea being that the the point he was making about our alt-right ideologies in looking at this particular joke is that you see time and time and time again, especially in the contemporary alt-right, that it doesn't matter so much what they're saying so long as they feel like they're winning. So long as they feel like they are the ones who are winning the argument based upon the rules that they define, that's all that matters. And so if they want to use a Middle Ages that is light and bright and cheery and idyllic, they will do that. If they want to use a Middle Ages that is bloody and dirty and gritty and quote unquote barbaric, they will do it. And it doesn't matter that there is logical inconsistency there so long as they, so long as it's something that makes them feel good and so long as it's something where they feel like they're winning against their perceived enemies. And we know obviously that as medievalists, we know that the Middle Ages was neither the kind of the version of light and bright and cheery that they want to promote because light and bright and cheery to them means all white. It means where things were in their quote unquote proper order, i.e. with men and Christianity at the top of the order and everyone else laboring underneath them despite of threats of, or because of threats of violence from those at the top. And that the barbaric middle ages that they sort of celebrate is their reaction against what they would see as a perversion of that order. And so the dark and barbaric Middle Ages is one in which whiteness is violently dominating or violently reacting against incursions against that perceived order. So that's one of the reasons why Vikings and Crusaders are, as far as I understand it, sort of two of the most, if not the most commonly used ideas, tropes, memes, that are used by these folks because it is the it is that kind of violent reaction against the what they believe their the perceived order ought to be, and that makes sense that they would go for those groups. I mean, if it's re- really about violence, <laughs> they're not going for like church councils and <laughs> church lawyers. Right? That would be a totally different neo medievalism. <laughs> like, but do that maybe. I think when people perceive the Middle Ages as the way that they do in the popular imagination. I think they see it as a struggle between good and heroic forces and 
evil barbaric forces. So, so those mentalities coexist. And as Paul says, I think uh, depending on what you're trying to promote, your allegiance will shift, right? Uh, in things that celebrate the Vikings very often, um, for instance, the Viking TV shows, it, it appears at first that the Vikings are the barbarians, but you find out that, you know, it's actually the English that they're attacking. They're, they're actually more evil and darker. Um, so I, I think that those two things coexist when people think about the medieval world. Yeah, I, I have to just interject here that as a Greek, it strikes me always as a little bit odd. It takes some adjusting when people, you know, take the ninth or 10th century as some point of origin <laughs> because like nothing happened I, before then <laughs> yes yes there's there's some stuff that happened before that and and you mentioned this throughout the book that the middle ages is in a certain sense in an invented period and it's not a real thing and, and this is well known by anyone who's taken you know history 101 on the middle ages that it's defined as some as a period that came after something the roman empire or whatever and before something else which is early modernity now, how you characterize all that stuff in between positively, nobody really knows. We're still looking for that. But the idea that you you would find some sort of place of, of a normative origin where your people were pure and whatever in that period can only really happen probably if you're along the fringes, like the most barbaric northern fringes of Anyway, in Greece, in Greece, you know, there's this saying where we say when, when we were building Parthenons, they were eating acorns in the trees. So, I mean, it's not the sorry, I'm I'm opening up a whole other can of worms here. <laughs> Indeed, so. Um, but uh, it so we're talking about the invention of the Middle Ages as in this positive sense, and you mention often in the book the Romantic Revival, this 19th century movement. Can you talk a little bit about why that's so important? Sure. It's a series of contradictions in a lot of ways. Uh, the Romantic period is sort of a rebellion against the Renaissance that comes before it. It's a rebellion against what are seen as very powerful structures uh, and systems and people who oppress uh, what was considered the natural human spirit. Uh, it was very much about individualism. So if you think about uh, in the literary world, the way that Romantic poets received a book, a poem like Paradise Lost, um, Milton's Paradise Lost, which is considered kind of the quintessential text of the Renaissance. It's uh, loaded with classical allusions. It's very difficult to unpack. You have to be very learned to do it. Milton knew Hebrew and Greek and Latin uh, and buried all kinds of puns into the words that he chose. Uh, and it's some sentences are whole stanzas. <laughs> it's a very weighty text. The Romantics took that, which is uh, Paradise Lost, of course, is about the fall of man. Uh, the Romantics took it and decided that Satan was the hero um, because Satan was rebelling against a tyrannical God, right? And an unfair structure. And he was kind of a Promethean figure uh, who was an individualist. And um, not only did they celebrate Satan as Lucifer in the poem, as a fallen angel, right? Who, who may have been in the right, but Byron, Lord Byron, who was, who was a famous romantic poet, even said once that Milton probably should have written it in rhyme. <laughs> like Dante, he should have done it in Teresa Rima, uh, right, in a much more simple rhyming structure. So what that means is, is both that they celebrated the individual and they rejected what they saw as artifice, as things that were too forced and too learned. Oh, I forgot to mention, too, that uh, the Romantics, when they were looking to throw off what they saw as uh, the colonial strictures of Rome and the strictures of religion, very often in the form of the Catholic Church uh, in Western Europe, they look back to the Middle Ages for what it meant to be a sort of pure human being, an innocent human being before all of those uh, corrupting influences were piled on top of you. So they look back to things like the Vikings, to King Arthur, who fought the tariffs being paid to Rome uh, and went on to conquer the world in many, mm. many versions of Arthurian legends. So they, they dug up all these old things that they thought were pre-Christian and pre-technology uh, and really celebrated them. So how this turns into nationalism, uh, a good example is the Grimm brothers who are responsible for many of the fairy tales that you know. While Germany was in the process of becoming a nation, which it doesn't do until the 1800s, the Grimm brothers were not just writing fairy tales, they were in, involved in what they saw as a 
cultural reconstruction project. So they did a lot of linguistic studies on medieval German languages, Germanic languages. They did studies of Germanic and Norse myths and tried to reconstruct a German identity and a German people that existed before Christianity and before Roman conquest and things like that. So they built this whole cultural identity that helped form Germany. And the problem with that kind of nationalistic construction is that it's not just about geographical borders. It's, it's about the essence of a people. It's trying mm. to define yeah. who people are in their hearts, right? And, and in their souls. And inevitably that sets you up in opposition to all of the other people around you. Uh, inevitably, you make enemies. It didn't take long for the same myths and linguistic and folklore theories used by the Brothers Grimm to evolve is the wrong word, to turn into the same nationalistic myths uh, that the Germans used in Nazi Germany, right, in the Holocaust. It took less than 100 years for those things to form. I mean, if you're trying to excavate the, um, the soul of a folk, a people, mm-hmm. and and to excavate it for out from under the inst- the structured institutions that you get from Roman law, the Catholic Church, the classical tradition, right? Exactly what you were saying about Milton. So get away from all these denaturing classical forms that hide your national essence, your your soul. It requires violence, either literary or ideological violence, but it very soon becomes social violence. I mean, I find that the the romantics were definitely as an aesthetic or ideological, even philosophical movement, trying to get out from under the structures of the Enlightenment. You know, what's interesting is that in in my field, in Byzantine studies, this kind of had the opposite effect in the sense that one of the avenues that European artists and intellectuals took in trying to get away from like the classical columns and national structure was to, and Byzantine art was one of those alternatives that they turned to as something that was looser and freer Mm. from those kinds of structural constraints, albeit not national. They also took it to be very like gay friendly. Mm. Yeah. Oh, Oh yes. So in the 19, late 19th century, there were many artists and art historians, um, either who were gay or, you know, were in favor of, you know, kind of more openness. And they thought Byzantine art was much more conducive to uh, those kinds of expressions, which doesn't correspond to anything in Byzantine culture. Like, this, is, <laughs> this is not at all how the Byzantines you know, viewed their art or whatever. That's like an alternative root of 19th century European romanticism. I think there's an echo, too, of the way an obsession with individualism can turn into nationalism if you look at American political rhetoric. Once once you can convince someone to think that uh, someone is going to take their individualism away, <laughs> take their, their rights away, uh, it's very easy to turn them against other people. And while that the Romantic movement brought us a lot of really important things because of that individualism, uh, women's rights, the abolition of slavery, revolutions, you know, a, a lot of things that society would be very different without. I think it it also could be manipulated by people in power pretty easily. Oh, yeah. And I think it's all around us. Like, if you just look at these armed militias, mm-hmm. um, they're all on the surface of it. They're very much they're all about overthrowing the oppressive structures of the state that they see tyrannizing them, like this whole sort of sovereign citizen idea and all of this, in order to release the inner free man who has to be armed like that's the declaration of personal sovereignty is having your own army that you're carrying on you right and yet my suspicion is that that is just the surface that in reality they're basically auditioning to be the paramilitary thugs that the government uses for Mm -hmm. for tyrannical purposes and i think we saw this like last week right yes i think it's really it's the most one of the most blatant cases of projection that I've seen. <laughs> it's like, pick me, pick me. I, I can anyway. Sorry, I digress. Polly, were you gonna? Okay. No, I mean, I, I I can't say I disagree with you. I mean that um, that there does seem to be that the rampant and aggressive individualism does seem to want to sublimate itself to a state that recognizes the superiority of them. 
and that that's really what it's about that it's not really about the tyranny of the state it's about the it is about whether or not the state privileges them above other people and if it does they will join it happily with their as a as a paramilitary and if it does not they will oppose it as a paramilitary but there are uh, their, their ideological chatter about it being individualistic. It's, it's a cover. It's a smoke screen. I think even probably for themselves that, oh, yeah. yeah, that they, they, they probably believe their own rhetoric, but, um, I think they, I think they believe their own hype. Yeah. It's, it's about a racial order. And if they see that the state order is aligning with their racial order, they'll join it. And if not, not. And in, in all of this, there's all this chatter or clash going on about the white Middle Ages, right? Like this is mm. th their medievalist arm is all about th this idea of, of a pure white, I guess, Western Europe. So what are the contours of that debate? I mean, you, you go over them in the book. I, I think our audience would be interested in knowing what that debate is about. Sure. I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of contours to it, so I, I can only get into it partially. Um, but there is this idea that that has been floating around in right wing circles for a long time that the Middle Ages were effectively this panacea of whiteness, this place time where not only were white people at the top of the pyramid, they were in effect the only people in the pyramid at all. And so this creates that kind of uh, fantasy land that white nationalists specifically, not necessarily, like uh, white supremacy ultimately leads to white nationalism, but white nationalism is fundamental, fundamentally about uh, whiteness's interaction with political structures and, and the state. And so the idea behind white nationalism, this is the fantasy time to which they want to return either uh, either purely within their minds or that they want to force the state in order to uh, force the state to enact that there's this idea that the proper of order of things is that people of di different racial groups be placed into the different parts of the world in which they are from and secondary to that is the possibility of a state where white people are recognized as the top of the uh, power, you know, the, the privileged pyramid, and that everyone else is ordered below them. And so they have a very vested interest in this idea of the Middle Ages being either predominantly or exclusively white. It's one of the reasons why the publication that I founded and that Amy and I worked on for a while, The Public Medievalist, we, we created the series Race, Racism in the Middle Ages, trying explicitly to tear down the idea of the whites only Middle Ages, trying to, uh, trying to complicate and dismantle that myth. Because we as medievalists know that in order to find places that only had people that today would be recognized as white, you have to look at more and more and more parochial, rural, small places. And the more you look at places that were mm -hmm. large cities along trade routes, that you find more and more people who today would be recognized as people of color. And that that is not a bad thing, that that is a good thing. And that's important. It's important on a whole variety of reasons to show the diversity of the Middle Ages. Not to say that the Middle Ages was, again, some liberal panacea, because it wasn't. But for, for example, for people of color today to be able to look at the Middle Ages and to see themselves represented there, that's important. Uh, it's important for the number of, say, um, academics or students that I've heard from who are people of color who've said that they have been questioned both by friends, family, and other academics, why they are interested in the Middle Ages. Yeah, yeah, no, I've heard this, yeah. Exactly, because there is this idea that it's not for them, that it's not about them. And that's wrong. It's just straight up wrong. Um, it has everything to do with both this sort of right-wing idea of the Middle Ages, but also, frankly, the way that the Middle Ages have been taught in schools, the way that it has been represented in popular culture, the stories that we reproduce and replicate and privilege uh, that come from the Middle Ages, that those have tended to, at least over the 20th century and still today, privilege white faces. 
I, those are only a few of the contours of this debate, but I think that that's partially what's at stake. It's about who, it's about whether or not there is a red velvet rope that says whites only on it in front of our discipline or not. You hear echoes of this. For example, it comes up with the why is the United States such a violent society? Someone will invariably say, because it's racially mixed, mm -hmm. from people who are not invested in white supremacy. It's just kind of like a, some sort of sociological fact that apparently we know. And as an ancient medieval historian, I know that's not an explanation for, for, for that. Like medieval societies are incredibly diverse and didn't have this kind of conflict in many, many cases. I got to wonder whether there's some kind of little bit of, of that kind of racial thinking that's gotten into the um, you know, popular sociology. Yeah, I think uh, when you look at medieval societies, the more diverse uh, and interfaith they are, uh, the safer they are. I mean, that's, that's historically true, right? If you look at uh, Al-Andalus, which is uh, Muslim Spain, Muslim ruled Spain uh, in, in the earlier part of the Middle Ages, if you were a Jewish person, you definitely wanted to live there. <laughs> yeah. e even though Jews weren't in charge, uh, you definitely wanted to live there instead of, say, France or England, where you could be thrown out of your house and evicted from the country and burned. Uh, in Al-Andalus, Muslims and Christians and Jews lived in the same place and worked together and wrote poetry together and sang and did scholarship together. And it wasn't perfect, right? There were, there were all kinds of incursions and there were uprisings and things like that, um, but it was certainly a less violent and more um, stable and more intellectual place to be than a place that was only uh, a Christian society. And conversely, if you were a white Anglo-Saxon or a white French person, you're the most at risk for being attacked by white Scandinavians. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> By far. And, and you're safest in Al-Andalus mm -hmm. and in Byzantium. Byzantium had flamethrowers, so they could deal with Viking. <laughs> but like you're safer from them there. Uh, this is a part of the myth that really boggles me. Like if you look at, to flip Fox News on its head, white on white crime in the Middle Ages, <laughs> it's pervasive. It's like, it's just incredible. So I'm kind of wondering what social utopia the white supremacists are imagining if they're ideal for their own society. It's like, I don't know, England and Scandinavia in the ninth and 10th centuries. Like, they, no, have they heard their, of the Dane law? Yeah, their, their utopia involves violence. Their utopia includes violence. That's the difference. Yeah, yeah. That's we tend true. to think of yeah. utopic visions as being inherently peaceful and, uh, and where everybody gets along, whereas I, no. I'm not the first person to say it, but white supremacy and white nationalism is kind of a suicide cult in that they privilege a such a small, like increasingly smaller and smaller and more and more and more pure uh, ideas of whiteness and more and more shedding layers of exclusion of people because, um, because fascism and white supremacy and white nationalism all require an enemy. And mm -hmm. as soon as one enemy falls, they have to find a new one, either external or internal, or often both. And so come and see the violence inherent in the system, to quote Monty Python. But the violence inherent in the system is fascism. And so it's kind of unsurprising, maybe, that they are looking to these societies that were at war with each other and at war with themselves and seeing uh, a place that they want to live, but seeing a place that they want to live as the in-group, obviously, not the out, as the out-group. Yeah, 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 you, you're, you're quite right. Um, I just read Tom Shippey's um, book on the Vikings, Laughing Shall I Die? Mm. And it just came out, and, and he actually makes that point, um, which is that this Viking ethos is, is, is kind of a death cult. Hmm. In other, yeah. So it's either you're inflicting violence and you're heroic, or you are heroically enduring it in this kind of grim, stoic way that also proves your manliness, mm -hmm. and and that's what it's all about. Ultimately, it's about the violence. Uh, speaking of violence, it, let's talk a little bit about the Crusades um, because they come up in the book, and obviously they're very central to the construction of, of these um, white identities. And I should, you know, I should tell you a story that a colleague of mine uh, had. She was um, 
she's teaching at a Catholic university and teaching the crusades. And she had a group of students come in um, to her classes in morning class where they were going to talk about the fall of Jerusalem in the kind of narrative progression of the course. And they said that they had been fasting and praying all night to come to the lecture in, you know, in preparation for the lecture on the fall of Jerusalem. I mean, wow. I guess that's one way to do it. Like <laughs> yeah. reading yes. is another thing, but I mean, <laughs> okay, whatever, sure. Whatever works for you. So how are the crusades, uh, you know, churned up and spat out by the groups that you studied? Oh, the Crusades. Oh, <laughs> um, first of all, I want to give like a, a shout out to Mike Horswell, who's who's really, I think he does some of the best work nowadays uh, on the legacy of the Crusades, particularly through the 19th and early 20th centuries. And we reference him in the book, but, he, but he's really do, done a lot of great stuff lately. So the Crusades are complicated because our, our book takes the long view. The Crusades, there's been a huge shift in scholars interpretation of the crusades over the 19th and 20th and now 21st centuries which has seen scholars taking just about every possible position when it comes to the reasons for the crusades the morality behind the crusades things like that and a lot of that has to do with the individual scholars personal perspectives religious upbringings as much as it has to do with the actual evidence on the ground as, uh, uh, anyway but that churn that histo historiographical churn means that just about anyone who wants to take any position on the Crusades that they want can find a scholar who will support, right. wh whether it's a scholar from the 60s or the 80s or now, um, will find someone who will, broad broadly speaking, support their position. And that's, I think, an element of it that we don't really talk too much about in the book, is, is about its intersection with, uh, with scholars, but there is that element of it that is there. And so... Contemporary white supremacists look at the Crusades, again, through this very heroic, this, this heroic death cult idea. They look at it as a model for who they should be and what they should do. They look at it as a model of the proper way to fight against multiculturalism, particularly vis-a-vis -vis Muslims. And this really has become turbocharged. It was there before 9-11, but it really became turbocharged since 9-11. I mean, crusader memes are extremely popular on the internet. And actually, I'm, I, uh, in, in trying to promote the public medievalist and trying to help to sort of roll the rock up the hill when it comes to the popular understanding of the Middle Ages, I am a member of many Facebook groups that are just, you know, that are just people who are interested in the Middle Ages, but invariably, I find about two thirds of the posts there seem to be people who are celebrating cru the Crusades and Crusaders. And this is coming, I think, I, I know that some of it is coming from accounts that are definitely alt-righty, but some of them it's very difficult to tell. But one way or another, there is this, there is this intense lionization of the Crusades amongst the contemporary alt-right, and that that is spilling out into more casual uh, enjoyment of medievalisms in the Middle Ages through some of these vectors in social media. Conversely, in terms of the use of the Crusades by people like ISIS or like Osama bin Laden, which we also touch on, that's also very complicated because the Crusades has been, um, been grasped by those folks who, who try to paint uh, everyone that they are opposing as crusaders, um, because they understand over the course of the 20th century, as decolonializing movements um, swept across uh, the Middle East, Western incursions and European domination through imperialism and colonization really was painted were painted as crusaders. Something that also a lot of, <laughs> in a complicated way, uh, a lot of uh, European nations also embraced their, the, the idea that they were on a neo-crusade. So everybody was thinking, everybody was, everybody was thinking this was, uh, the, these were crusaders. And so uh, Osama bin Laden famously um, called the United, United States crusaders, but also called, uh, they, they call uh, people who opposed them in the conflicts with India crusaders as well. So again, it's kind of a throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks kind of situation. And that there's not necessarily much thinking about the crusades on, <laughs> in any quarter of this, in any kind of sophisticated 
way that it's just about this is a a way that I can label my label my opponents and see this fight that I am that I am encouraging other people to participate in and die in as a massive struggle of civilizations that has gone on for a thousand years that that has a kind of intellectual yeah. cachet via Samuel Huntington's article lo looking at the clash of civilizations all the way through his terrible article let me be very clear terrible article about the clash of civilizations this idea that it is that they are seeing themselves through a mythic lens and so everyone on every side of this that wants to try to convince people to die for their cause is trying to do so through saying you will be the mythical hero like we saw in the middle ages and that's that's kind of that's 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 basically the shape of it yeah yeah and a, and a movement that overtly sanctifies violence just by itself would be appealing to them and add that the main target are muslims and that's the bonus yeah, I should add that in cultures that trace their genealogy, as it were, back to Byzantium in some way, it's very different perception. Mm -hmm. uh, for all that, you know, Byzantium is a, a, a Christian culture and the Christian culture sometimes, but it was a target of at least one crusade. Mm -hmm. You can add some more to the list. And so there's deep suspicion in Orthodox countries about anything that smacks of crusading. In fact, this has been extended just generally whenever Western armies, doesn't matter who, claim to be inflicting violence for some kind of ideological purpose. The, the default, the instinct is, okay, that, yeah, that, the suspicion, like, no, no, that's not it. You know, like George Bush waging the first feminist war in history in Afghanistan or, you know, what, you know, those kinds of things. Oh, don't call it that. Oh, <laughs> Wow. No, no, no. Yeah, we need some big <laughs> scare quotes there. They, but this is how they tried to present it. And mm -hmm. this was like either right before or right after he, and you talk about this in the book, he wanted to call the op the military operation in Iraq a crusade. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he did. <laughs> I remember yeah. that press conference. Yeah. And then they backed away from it yep. and they came up with another name, which was Infinite Justice. And then they backed away from that too, because all the religious leaders told them me <laughs> that only God can do that. So that's <laughs> rather blasphemous. And then finally they came up with enduring freedom, which yeah, was and all of this is about mythologizing. Oh violence. yeah. 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 All of just it. Pick your mythology. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. yeah. And it's very easy to see how we, uh, y y people often, talk about missing bush uh, in the oh, current no, administration no. yeah but it's it's very yeah. easy to see how that rhetoric and that political propaganda got us where we are today where you know the president had an advisor like steve bannon who goes around the globe uh saying that the conflict between christians and muslims is inevitable and we need to prepare for a holy war i mean it, it starts 20 years ago yes that, that is um, arrested and soon to be felon steve bannon <laughs> Allegedly, we <laughs> we're gonna have to put allegedly in front of yes, all of this, but a lot yeah. of quotes here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just want to jump in as a Byzantinist here because I often feel that the the culture that I study is off to the side of a lot of this. Mm -hmm. It is geographically between the Christian West and the and the Muslim world, and it also ideologically it just doesn't follow a lot of these rules. So not only is it a different approach to crusading altogether. But it gets dragged in in the worst ways, you know. Um, so generally, let's say the European right or in the mainstream European intellectual tradition is not favorable to Byzantium. It's always been talked about in, in very, very negative ways since the Enlightenment and before, but especially since the Enlightenment. It's just degenerate. You know, it, it was exactly all of the things that today we you would call civilized, <laughs> right? Like all this structure and law and there they're they're not dedicated to a cult of violence and, and and so forth and then i i noticed that like in a lot of the um the debates about the role of islam and the contributions of islam to western european intellectual history some on the especially french right were dragging byzantium into this to say oh no you're europe so now suddenly byzantium is part of europe it hadn't been before 
<laughs> Europe didn't need Muslims to teach them about Aristotle because look, the Byzantines, they're Christians and they had Aristotle all along. And so it's a very instrumental use and then is discarded. When you, know, you don't need it to score some point against Muslims, then you forget about it, right? And that I don't think is a kind of inclusion that I think Byzantinists should embrace. If those schools of thought want to go the extra mile and, and include Byzantium in other discussions, right? Like, like if they're going to have discussion, yeah, like even about chivalry, like th this is not a thing in Byzantium, except very late. Um, they had some, you know, there were, there were actually feudal states from the West imposed there after the Fourth Crusade. And you start to get some of this kind of chivalric literature being translated into Greek. And I think, you know, the odd thing is that precisely because the culture didn't celebrate male violence in exactly that way, the Westerners at the time in the medieval West depicted Byzantine men as effeminate. Mm. You know, like the first resort is not to violence. Uh, you know, you eat with a fork, you can write, yeah, <laughs> these kinds of things. I'm always a bit uh, cautious when I see Byzantium dragged into these things. That's a digression. I wanted to bring up some uh, methodological points that you make in the book. And one of them I really, really liked. And I would just like to get more from you about why you were writing this. So in a few places, I counted three. So I went back and I reread the book and I found one more where you say, don't be fooled by anybody who wants to pretend medieval people did not have the same range of desires, dreams, and identities that we do today, right? Like the people in the Middle Ages aren't this unfathomably alien other that we can't understand. So why are you writing this? That sentence in particular. That idea that, yeah. that these are people like us and th there's no reason to treat them as, as different. Um, so I have, I have sort of a philosophical reason and a personal reason. <laughs> and the philosophical reason is that it, it's very easy when you're studying medievalism, the recreation of medieval things in popular culture, to just go in as a fact checker and say, you're getting this wrong, you're getting this wrong, you're getting this wrong. And that in and of itself is a form of gatekeeping. I think it's, it's very easy to slip into gatekeeping when we're confronted with um, popular medievalism and say, you know, you can't possibly access the Middle Ages, you can't possibly enjoy it unless you have my level of expertise. And, and that really walls people off from it. I think if, it can be dangerous because if you want to fix public perceptions of the Middle Ages, if you want to show them uh, how rich and interesting and diverse the world was, then you can't tell them that the past is something that they can't ever really know or understand. I went into medieval studies looking for information about women <laughs> back when I was an undergraduate. And I was told over and over again that there was really nothing to be found, uh, that it was a patriarchal society, that women really didn't play a role, that any representations of women that I read uh, would just be men sort of superimposing an ideology onto a text. But when I started doing the research for myself, I found the opposite of that, right? I found women uh, who were writing, I found women who were religious scholars and activists, women I could understand and relate to, um, even in texts written by men. And I think what I try to do in my own writing is really show that richer view, right? Show how we can connect over time. Because I think if you, if you look at someone else's experiences in the past, you can understand your present. And medieval people, have the same desires and drives that we do. And if we listen to them, we might learn a little bit more about ourselves. Uh, I think the danger is believing that we can't experience the same kinds of oppressions and problems, uh, that we can't fall into the same kind of wars or the same kinds of political issues or religious persecutions because we are somehow so radically different, so much more evolved. I entirely applaud um, th that idea and the statements that you make. And, and in, in part, I have my own reasons for that. I fundamentally believe that human beings are, are essentially human beings and can, and can actually understand each other. I don't think that the barriers of language and culture are so insurmountable. And anyway, it maybe it may just a humanistic delusion that I have, but I just think people can actually communicate and, and, and express themselves um, in ways that are mutually intelligible. 
I mean, for women, we have a lot of evidence for women in the Middle Ages. We have definitely less evidence for, um, you know, gay and lesbian and so forth. I am 100% certain that they existed exactly as much as they do today. Mm -hmm. And our problem is not a problem whether they existed. It's a problem of the representation and the taxonomies that were used in that culture, the intellectual tools that they had for expressing what they were feeling and so forth. But I think these are not insurmountable. What really troubles me is the way in which scholars will erect these disciplinary walls. And I think in part of it is just to claim expertise. Like, no, you can't understand this period of this culture. It's so alien and different. They didn't have, oh, you have legs. Oh no, they didn't have legs. I mean, it's just like, it's so over the top sometimes. That, and, and I think it's gatekeeping, as you said, right? Like it's no, no, if you want to enter into this domain, you have to learn all of our rules. And here we're going to post them outside in there and all this difficult jargon and and, all, and I, oh, I just don't think, I've had debates with, with colleagues about this. I put it to one of them like this, and it's going to sound to you like a parody, but then he immediately said, yes, that's, that's it. That's exactly what I think. <laughs> that all of history is basically divided into segments of mutually incommensurate periods where the rules and language and ideas of one just simply cannot be translated into those of the other, and people cannot communicate across them. And that goes for us too. Like as scholars looking back, we are forever cut off from what it means to be human in whatever period. Yeah. That's wow. a little shocking. And I think, <laughs> I think, you know, no one else in history, as far as I know, has felt that way. I think <laughs> that there's a legacy of people learning from each other and, and sort of absorbing and assimilating information from the cultures that came before, right? From his, aren't we supposed to learn from history? You can't do that if you if you put barbed wire up around yeah, it. So the theoretical response to that would be that we're not actually learning, we're misinterpreting always. And that, that may work for us, like mis misunderstanding is creative, right? It enables us to imagine new things, but they're not the things that whoever wrote whatever or did whatever intended. It's always a process of, incommensurate, mutually unintelligible misunderstandings. Yeah. And yeah. But that is fundamental to the human experience. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. I think that you and I right now. That's exactly that that is fundamental to communication. Communication is this at just at its core is this deeply imperfect way that we have tried to figure out how to close the unclosable gap between my mind and yours. And that communication and the reception of communication particularly is always a creative act that requires interpretation and requires imagination and that you will get wrong. I mean, we know, we know just from our textual conversations with one another, when you're texting somebody, how many times do you misinterpret what oh, somebody yeah, yeah, yeah. has said because you're looking at it basically through a textual medium. Okay, so looking at what your scholar, friend, colleague was saying, looking back on the Middle Ages, we only have uh, the, we only have textual communication. So yeah, of course, everything that we are doing is an interpretation and everything that we are doing is understanding that we are, go, we are seeing the Middle Ages through ourselves, that we are looking at the Middle Ages through the lens of ourselves and no number of fancy degrees on our wall really gets over that fact. I think for me, this really bores into the, the, the question of what studying history is for. Why, why do we do it? Because if it's just, as I've heard some people say, like if it's just because it's interesting inherently or because they are to, to see a society that is so different from ours, like, like impenetrably different from ours, I, that, that doesn't inspire me as a person. I don't really see the purpose of that. Whereas for me, much like I was talking about communication, I study history to find people who are unlike from me and also alike me. Exactly. And, and yep. also like well, me. well put. Yeah, that it is the that it is holding those two contradictory ideas simultaneously in my head. And I think that the best history professors, the best history teachers at any level, 
are the ones that are cultivating historical empathy in their students, the ones who are cultivating the ability in their students to look at someone different from themselves, either removed by time, space, or both, and to see someone who is very different and also fundamentally the same, because that's a joyful thing. And I risk getting a little me metaphysical here, but uh, I think in that way, we are very close to medieval people because that is the relationship that they had with the past. Uh, if you think about the way that uh, stories of Rome uh, entered into Middle English literature, right? You know, they, they very much absorbed and in, inserted themselves and tried to understand across history. They had a whole, whole arguments about uh, which of their favorite pagans would get to go to heaven, right? Or, or would be stuck in, <laughs> in purgatory and, and which was true and how did you judge their souls? So, so I think in, in that way, we're very much like medieval people. On that note, and because we're almost out of time, I just wanted to ask one more question. And that is to get to the positive about the Middle Ages, because reading your book, someone might come away as thinking, well, mm. this is just a repository of everything that's going wrong. And so I was just wondering, can the Middle Ages be used or invoked or studied for good? And, and what would that be? Yeah, we try to address that in the last chapter. Um, we, we try to detail uh, the, the ways that that can happen. One example, uh, and it's a very sad one today, is Black Panther, um, mm, because yep. Chadwick Boseman has just passed. But that is a medievalism that's inspirational, right? And, and is an effort to reclaim a past that feels lost. Matthew Vernon has done some really good writing on that. Uh, there's a lot of medieval inspired fantasy nowadays that's making an effort to be more global and inclusive and diverse. Uh, Saladin Ahmed's um, Throne of the Crescent Moons is one. Samantha Shannon, Priory of the Orange Tree, Naomi Novik's Spinning Silver, uh, S.A. Chakraborty's Trilogy. So all these look to expand the medieval world and introduce people to different kinds of myths and different kinds of history. And there are also more pragmatic medievalisms like the maker movements, uh, rediscovering medieval recipes, uh, medieval costumes. I find cosplay really fascinating. Uh, like people put a lot of effort <laughs> into medieval inspired costumes, but it's it's more than just something that they're wearing. It's a way to feel feel like they're truly themselves, right? To take some kind of mythic or historical inspiration uh, and use it to augment their own identity and really celebrate it. Um, and environmentalism, it is another positive medievalism. Uh, and yeah. this is something that rom the romantics thought as well, right? If, if we're yeah, looking yeah. to preserve something more natural. Now, these can always slip into something more negative. Uh, environmentalism is a good example. The Christchurch shooter was an eco-fascist, right? He was very pro-environment. He just happened to be a white supremacist environmentalist who believed that the only way to preserve the environment was to uh, wipe out other people. So I think the key here is that the Middle Ages itself, you know, and the use of the Middle Ages itself is fundamentally neutral, um, but it's what you're intending to do with it. That's important. Are, are you playful? Are you celebratory? Are you curious? Are you learning? Or are you using it to hurt people? It's, it seems like a gray area, but it's really not. And that's one of the things in the book that's really important to us is that the Middle Ages has just as much to offer to the people who want to make the world a better place than the people who want to enact violence on other people. Just because it has been used in the past so often by people to try to promote hatred and, and violence and oppression doesn't mean that it can't also be used positively by people who are trying to make it inclusive and joyful and something where we can all where we can use it to promote peace and a better world i'd like to mention just how much medieval poetry celebrates ambiguity forces you to stop and think about your position and what just what you just read like how, how am i supposed to read this and that really undermines the kind of the idea of life as battle lines Mm -hmm. um, it, there's really a lot of that. And, and you know what, that even happens in like Beowulf, like what mm -hmm. you might otherwise take to be a straight, you know, oh, good versus evil. Or, no, no, no. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. This is a very problematic character. Like, like Achilles and Homer. I mean, this is mm -hmm. not a 
a poem in praise of Achilles. Achilles is a madman. I mean, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he's someone who, who has these heroic ideals and just takes them so far that he just loses his humanity. And he has to reclaim it at the end through visualizing a father's pain at the death. Of, it's just, you know, anyway. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think there's a lot of that. And, uh, and uh, let's hope uh, that, that, that the Middle Ages will be associated more with that. Uh, Amy, Paul, thank you. This has been a wonderful conversation. And thank you. I, I thank hope you. people will read this book. All right. Bye. Bye. All right. Bye. <laughs>